recording and video on. Hello everybody, good to see so many of you here. Um, hopefully this is broadcasting on YouTube as well and being stored for future occasions. Um, but I'm not quite sure whether it is at the moment, but there we go. Um, thank you very much to everybody who went into the quiz. Um, lots of you, I think, um, did very well. Um, there were five questions. Uh, the question that everybody seemed to get wrong was about quaternary structure. Quaternary structure means that you have more than one polypeptide chain, not that you have four. Um, next webinar is on Sunday the 26th um, of March, uh, next Sunday at five o'clock. Osmosis, water potential and water potential calculations. Um, if anybody finds this any anywhere useful, then um, please recommend it to your friends and uh, um, share it whatever okay um hope you can all hear me anybody has any questions throughout it go to the q a box um type your question in and i'll answer it uh, as we go along if i can so what we're doing today is looking at protein structure and protein function and we'll start with they have many functions now they have a structural function um, they could be um, collagen or myosin making up muscles or tendons or ligaments they can catalyze reactions by having an active site which is specific to a particular molecule. So for instance, you could have amylase which breaks down um, amylose, uh, which is a component of starch and breaks it down into maltose. Um, pepsin, remember in endopeptidase, which is in your stomach, endo cuts within, inside a, another protein chain. And polymerase, you could either have the DNA polymerase which joins DNA nucleotides together, or you could have RNA polymerase, which joins them together and does what it says on the tin, it makes polymers out of nucleotides. We can transport things. So principally, most importantly, we can transport oxygen because the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen changes depending on the concentration of oxygen that's around it. So we can go from oxyhemoglobin when the partial pressure is high in the lungs to dissociating when it's lower in the tissues and delivering oxygen. We can have proteins that work in communication. So remember insulin is a protein, it's only 51 amino acids. It was the first protein to be sequenced by the great Fred Sanger um, in the 1950s and that Insulin is released, remember, from the beta cells of the islets of Langerhans, where it's manufactured because you've got lots of endoplasmic reticulum in those cells, and it goes around your body and it binds to specific receptors. Now, running through enzymes, transport, communication, defense, transport across membranes, is all the concept of specificity. And specificity comes from the tertiary structure. And the tertiary structure is the overall three-dimensional shape of the molecule. Um, glucagon, remember, it's the antagonistic hormone. This is only 49 amino acids, or well, has an antagonistic effect, sorry, to insulin, in that it causes um, the breakdown of glycogen in glycogenolysis. Um, Proteins have a big role in defense. Again, specificity because you've got antibodies. And the specific part here is the variable part on the end of the antibody, which is complementary only to one antigen. Again, concept of tertiary structure and specificity and things being complementary. Transporting things across membranes. So um, sodium potassium pump powered by ATP. Um, this is important in establishing the ion concentration across axons. In active, in sorry, the uptake of ions and glucose and amino acids in the proximal convoluted tubule, and also absorption in small intestine. Sodium channels, these volt, voltage-gated sodium channels, mean that action potentials are possible. And aquaporins, remember. From the kidney you've got aquaporins in the collecting duct and the distal convoluted tubule and by changing the number of aquaporins you can alter the permeability of the membranes. 
So that was a quick run through of sort of diversity of structure, sorry, diversity of function. Now, what they all have in common, all proteins, all proteins are made of amino acids and they're a polymer of amino acids. And all amino acids are just made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and then two of them, which is methionine and cysteine, have sulfur in them. Okay, so here are some proteins, give you some diverse structures. So this is an aquaporin. This aquaporin is embedded in cell membranes. So the cell membrane would sit here. Now, the way the reason it sits here is that these parts of the protein, these would be non-polar parts because they can sit in the phospholipid bilayer, which is here. Remember, you've got the fluid mosaic model of, protein, of um, membrane structure, which says that the proteins are the mosaic and the um, phospholipids is the fluid. Now, an aquaporin enables water to travel through and the water can travel down its osmotic gradient, either into the cell or out of the cell. The aquaporin is going to be lined with um, polar or charged amino acids so that those water molecules can diffuse through that big carrier protein. These structures here, and um, we'll revisit this, but these are alpha helices. These are part of the secondary structure. Okay, <clears throat> another one that's enormously important. This is ATP synthase. So ATP synthase is used in chemiosmosis, where, which is the production of ATP through the flow of hydrogen ions down their concentration gradient. And remember this occurs in oxidative phosphorylation and photophosphorylation. Now the intermembrane space, which is here, um, that intermembrane space will have a buildup of hydrogen ions. Now those hydrogen ions are unable to flow through the inner mitochondrial membrane or the thylakoid membrane, depending on whether you're a chloroplast or a mitochondria. Then those hydrogen ions flow out and they flow out through ATP synthase. ATP synthase is a huge protein, lots and lots of different parts to it, but the hydrogen ions flowing out and as they flow out, they generate ATP through the rotation of this part. And here we've got, the, here over here, we've got the bits. This part is in the inner mitochondrial membrane or the thylakoid membrane. And here we've got lots and lots of alpha helices and beta sheets. Okay, plowing on. Here's some more proteins. So this is um, sodium potassium pump, calcium pump and proton pump. And again, sitting in the membrane. And then the sodium potassium pump, remember, is moving three sodiums out and is moving two potassiums in. Calcium pump, very important for the reabsorption of calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, so it controls um, muscular contraction. Because remember, release of the calciums moves the tropin in of the tropomycin and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> This rather elegant molecule is an antibody. Um, so we've got variable region here. And the variable region is specific to only one antigen. This is pepsin. Um, so these are two models here of different ways of modeling the structure. We've got an active site. And then we've got here, we've got disulfide bonds. And pepsin remembers the endopeptidase that you have in your stomach. Here's insulin. Um, two chains joined together by two disulfide bonds. Disulfide bonds occurring between the cysteines. And then we've also got a disulfide bond here. And remember, the insulin binds to a receptor, and that receptor is on the liver and the muscle cells. Here's hemoglobin. Um, hemoglobin is a classic carrier molecule. Um, it's got four heme groups. Um, so this here, 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 here. These are all what are called prosthetic groups. These are non-protein parts of a protein. 
And in the center of each one, we've got a metal iron, and the metal iron is iron. Now, do remember that each of the iron atoms can carry one oxygen. So we can, in total, carry one, two, three, four oxygens, which is, gives us our oxyhemoglobin. Now, the wonderful thing about hemoglobin is that it changes shape depending on how many oxygens are bound, which is a process called cooperative binding. So the first one's quite difficult to bind, but then the whole molecule changes shape, which makes it easier for the second and third ones to bind, which is why the dissociation curve is so steep over such a small range in partial pressures. Additionally, um, haemoglobin is affected by the pH in the red blood cell, which is why um, carbon dioxide, um, the concentration of carbon dioxide affects the affinity of the haemoglobin. Okay, we'll plow on. Right, so why does structure matter? Um, the structure dictates the shape and the shape gives the function. Now, when you're looking at protein structure um, for AS, you really need to know all of the stuff. So primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. But the way you need to apply it at A2 is very much in a synoptic manner, um, thinking about what things are caused by protein variations and differences in the primary structure. So I made a quick think through synoptic -y stuff. Um, first point that comes up often in synoptic stuff is that when you have a different allele, and it may be a recessive allele, that can be the result of a mutation, which is a change in the base sequence. If you have an insertion or a deletion mutation, um, well, that can shift the reading frame of the of protein synthesis so that you then alter the primary structure of everything after the mutation. Um, so as a result, the, you then have to emphasize that the tertiary structure would alter and the protein would not fold into its functionally correct shape. Um, other synoptic bits, um, the affinity of um, oxygen for hemoglobin, or sorry, hemoglobin for oxygen. Um, remember, you've also got fetal hemoglobin, and fetal hemoglobin has got greater affinity for oxygen because it's got a different primary structure, which gives it a different um, tertiary structure, slightly different to um, normal hemoglobin, maternal hemoglobin. So it's got a higher affinity for oxygen, which is why the oxygen um, goes on to the fetal hemoglobin across the placenta. Um, effects of pH. Uh, pH changing um, shape of enzymes, um, pH affecting activity of enzymes, uh, effect of temperature on proteins. Proteins are delicate molecules held together by weak bonds. So small changes in temperature, well, large changes in temperature as well, um, have a dramatic effect. Where temperature does not have a dramatic effect is where you get the um, protein from a thermophile. And the classic example for this is the polymerase in the polymerase chain reaction, where you take it from Thermophilus aquaticus, or TAC polymerase, and then you that's your thermophile, so it's very temperature stable, so you can heat, heat it to 95 degrees and it doesn't denature. Um, specificity, hugely important um, um, in terms of enzymes, because we've got active site and substrate hormones where they um, join with the receptor molecule, uh, antibodies where they join with the antigen and carrier molecules where they carry a specific thing across the um, plasma membrane. And remember the specificity comes from the shape and the shape which is the tertiary structure comes from the primary structure. Okay, so let's go through the basics. Um, there are proteins are made from 20 different types of amino acid. And here they are. Um, we've got the non-polar ones here across the top, and then the polar ones here. So these non-polar ones are the ones which will be quite happy sitting in the phospholipid bilayer, and these are the polar ones. These will be wanted to be 
on the outside of proteins. They'll want to be in the water or they'll be ones on the outside of the membranes or the inside of the membranes where the water is. The acidic and the basic ones are important because they form ionic bonds with each other. And then cysteine, remember, contains sulfur and that forms disulfide bonds. So basic structure, central carbon, and joined to that is the carboxylic acid. I'll take you through one. So here we go. So we've got amine, central carbon, joined to four molecules, four atoms, sorry. And then we've got the R group. Now R, remember, stands for variable. And the variable group can be many things, and it can be 20 things. The simplest is hydrogen which would give us glycine and there are lots more complicated ones as well now the way that you join two amino acids together is we take another glycine and we join it together so remember we've got our amine group and at the other end we've got a carboxyl group so we join the amine to the carboxyl and we eliminate the oxygen, the hydrogen, the hydrogen and we make water in a condensation reaction and then you have in the centre the peptide bond. Now we've joined two amino acids together to make a dipeptide as in disaccharide or dimer if we join three we form a tripeptide but we can keep on joining more on just like joining lego bricks together you can keep going for an almost infinite amount of time now the opposite of uh, condensation is hydrolysis lysis means to split and hydro is with the addition of water. So by hydrolysis, you can split this, and that's what, for instance, uh, pepsin does. Okay. So, went through all of that. This is the basic structure, amine carboxyl R group, which is your side chain. Joining them together, condensation reaction, forming water and forming a peptide bond, hence polypeptide with a protein. Reverse is hydrolysis, which splits the, the um, molecule by adding water. So here's formation. Now, you can keep joining things together to make a polypeptide. Now, the order of amino acids in a protein, you remember, is contained in the genes that you inherited from your parents. So when you were an egg that got fertilized, that's when you got all of the possible instructions for proteins that you could ever have. Um, and it's the sequence and number of amino acids. And this gives you the primary structure. So the primary structure is the order or sequence of amino acids in a protein. Remember from protein synthesis that you've got DNA, which is in the nucleus, this is transcribed into messenger RNA, and the messenger RNA goes to a ribosome where it's then translated into a sequence of amino acids. So here's four um, amino acids joining together to form a, um, I suppose that's a quad peptide, isn't it? Um, so we've got amine and we've got a condensation reaction forming water, and another one, and another one, and here are the side chains. But if you look at the pattern, we go nitrogen, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, carbon, and then a carboxyl group. And you can keep on joining them together for um, a very long time. So primary structure is the order of amino acids. And then we've got this concept of secondary structure. 
Now, secondary structure is caused by hydrogen bonds. And the hydrogen bonds occur between the nitrogen hydrogen, which gets slightly positive, and the double bonded oxygen, which is slightly negative. So when they form a weak bond, a weak hydrogen bond between the two, and the whole thing coils into either an alpha helices or a beta sheet. It used to be called a beta pleated sheet, but that tends to be going out of fashion. These are hydrogen bonds forming this secondary structure, but the hydrogen bonds don't occur between the R groups. Tertiary structure is the further folding of the secondary structure into a complex globular blob or the formation of long fibers. And quaternary structure is more than one polypeptide chain. So more than one polypeptide chain, so it's not four, but it's more than one. It's a fourth level of structure. So primary structure, remember, is order or sequence. Secondary structure is alpha helix or beta sheet. So this is between this slightly negative oxygen and this slightly positive hydrogen. And you form these weak hydrogen bonds, which mean that the whole thing folds into coils into an alpha helix. Got a question up at the top. Is it incorrect to call the NH2 part of an amino acid an amino group? Is it an amine group? Um, yes, it's an amine group. We'll call it an amine group. Okay, let's plow on. Um, We've now got, here we go, beta sheet. So beta sheet again between the slight positive and the slight negative hydrogens. Slight, sorry, slight positive hydrogens and slight negative oxygens. And it's folded back on itself. So here's again your alpha helix and your beta sheet. Hydrogen bonds here, 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 here and fold it back on itself, and then we've got secondary structure with the alpha helix here and weak hydrogen bonds here. But remember, the hydrogen bonds that form the secondary structure are not part of the R groups. Tertiary structure is the further folding of the whole thing. So you've got secondary structures here, and then you've got beta sheets here, but the whole thing is folded. Now, those folds are the result of all of the attractions and interactions between all of the R groups. Now, because there are 20 different R groups, those 20 different R groups have different properties. So some are attracted or repelled by water. Some are attracted to each other or repelled by each other, to some form extremely strong covalent bonds with each other. So then we get, so now that forms the tertiary structure, which is folding and turning the secondary structures into a more complex shape. So the bonds that, that hold the tertiary structure together and form the tertiary structure the tertiary structure is the resultant of the bonds that form between the R groups, are disulfide bonds, which are strong covalent bonds. And this is between two cysteine amino acids, and they can form strong disulfide bonds. And this is particularly important in thermophiles or anything that you want to make uh, a temperature stable. So there's been site-directed mutagenesis of stuff to make temperature stable washing powders by putting more um, covalent bonds, disulfide bonds in them. Now, ionic bonds, this is where you have a um, bond between a positive and a negative charge. So here we've got an ionic bond forming here between these two R groups. We've got a disulfide bond or a disulfide bridge between two cysteines. 
we can have hydrogen bonds between our groups here and here, or you can have hydrophobic interactions where, um, because most proteins um, are in the cytoplasm so, or outside, so they, life principally takes place in water, and the cytoplasm is full of water, so that the hydrophobic R groups tend to fold away from the outside, so they tend to be in the center, whereas the hydrophilic R groups tend to be on the outside. So the polar R groups would be on the outside and the non-polar ones would tend to be on the inside. Now, the analogy that I give to students for this is that imagine you are holding hands with all of your classmates. Um, the holding hands represents the peptide bonds. You're not allowed to let go of anybody under any circumstances. Um, if you joined 60 of you together, um, holding hands, the order that you're in is your primary structure. If you were then allowed to float free in three-dimensional space, so you went into the gym and floated free in three-dimensional space, um, if I left you there for an hour, then over time you would move furthest away from people you didn't like, but closest to people you wanted to be with, or you wanted to be on the inside of the blob or the outside of the blob. Now. If we then took those same people, they let go of each other and we reassembled them in a different chain and we repeated the process, as a result of being in a different order, we'd then form a different three-dimensional blob bundle of all of you and your classmates because the order that's in the primary structure determines the shape of the tertiary structure because the shape of the tertiary structure is the resultant of all of the interactions between all of the R groups. Good. So here are some pretty pictures of the bonds. So we've got a hydrogen bond here, um, disulfide bond, ionic bond, van der Waals interaction, which to be honest, I've never really understood, but there we go. And here, um, hydrophobic um, bit, where, which is folded away from the outside. Um, quaternary structure is when you have more than one polypeptide chain. So the classic quaternary structure is haemoglobin, um, and they're held together. So haemoglobin has got an alpha, two alpha, sorry, and two beta globin chains. Remember, these are alpha and beta globin, not alpha and beta glucose. Some proteins have non-protein parts called prosthetic groups. So for instance, you have the heme groups in the haemoglobin molecule. Those are required, referred to as being prosthetic groups. Some term that you occasionally come across is a conjugated protein. Now, a conjugated protein is a protein that interacts with things that aren't proteins. And these can be joined by strong covalent bonds or weak interactions. So, for instance, a glycoprotein is a conjugated protein because you've got um, sugars joined together to a protein. Prosthetic groups um, is a non-polypeptide unit. So this, for instance, is the prosthetic group that you'd have in um, haemoglobin. Um, it can be organic or inorganic, such as the metal ion, but it's not made of amino acids. So they're tightly bound to proteins, and you can even have a covalent bond. Here's a quaternary structure. So we've got two chains here, the big blue chain and the green chain. And these two chains are held together by a bond, and this gives it a quaternary structure. Now, yet again, Primary structure is order. Secondary structure is alpha helix or beta sheet. Tertiary structure is the three-dimensional shape, which is the resultant of all of the interactions between all of the R groups. Quaternary structure is more than one polypeptide chain and may include some heme groups. So, got a few Q and A's here.
So, Leia says, how do you know the difference between an ionic bond and a hydrogen bond? A ionic bond forms between a positive and a negative charge, whereas a hydrogen bond is between a slight negative and a slight positive charge, which is caused by the oxygen having the electron slightly close to it. Chloe says, van der Waals forces are caused by the movement of electrons around the atom in the electron shells, which cause a temporary dipole positive and negative in the atoms next to each other. It's the weakest intermolecular force. Thank you, Chloe. Um, I did, did know that, but I've thought, said I've never really understood it. So, um, there's a, but thank you for, for that, that's great. Um, anonymous viewer says, are we able to access the video again at a later date? That's very nice that you might be thinking that. Um, it should be streamed on YouTube and it might be saved, who knows. But uh, I hope, I'm glad you want to see it again. And somebody had a hand up. Um, but uh, if anybody wants to ask a question, please put it in the Q&A box. So, um, why is protein structure so important is that it dictates function, as I think I've gone on quite a lot about. Um, if you have a mutation in the DNA, you can lead to an amino acid substitution. Now, the classic example of this is um, sickle cell anemia. And sickle cell anemia, you have one um, amino acid which is substituted in the hemoglobin chain. Uh, I think it's a glutamic acid for a valine. It's one way around or the other way around. I can never remember which way around it is. But you just, you just change one of the nucleotides in a... Um, in the DNA triplet, and then that changes one codon, and that changes one amino acid. Um, and as a result of that, it changes the folding of the amino of the um, globin chain, so it compromises the function quite dramatic, dr dramatically. Denaturing proteins. Um, when the protein unfolds and loses its three-dimensional shape, it also loses its function because it loses its, because the function comes from the shape. So if you've got a enzyme, then remember the enzyme is a protein. The reason that it can catalyze a reaction is because it's got a active site, which is a specific shape. Now, if you change the shape of that active site through either increasing the temperature so that the bonds break or by changing the pH then it loses its function and is unable to catalyze the reaction. So how do you denature a protein? You heat it or you change the pH and remember heating increases the kinetic energy in the molecules and that leads to the atoms vibrating a lot and then they break the hydrogen bonds, um, holding the, the tertiary structure in shape. The whole thing tends to unravel and the active site changes shape. Therefore, it can't catalyze the reaction because it's no longer complementary to the substrate. Types of proteins um, are rather artificial distinctions, but there we go, between globular and fibrous. Um, Classic examples of globular proteins would be any enzyme, any transport protein, um, channel proteins, hormones, antibodies, and fibrous proteins. These are structural, um, hair, skin, ligaments, tendons. Hemoglobin, um, classic globular structure. So this hemoglobin is a globular protein, complex tertiary structure, and in this case, quaternary structure. And collagen is the classic example, which is in all the textbooks of something with which is fibrous because it's repeating. Um, it's got only three amino acids which repeat. So it forms these um, helices. And those helices have hydrogen bonds between the chains, which gives it um, tensile strength. So globular proteins fold up into a compact ball-like shape. Um, so the hydrophobic R groups tend to um, fold inwards. The hydrophilic tend to fold outwards. They're more soluble in water. 
Globular proteins tend to have a metabolic role and they have a wide range of amino acids in their structure. Whereas fibrous proteins, regular repetitive sequences, therefore they form long fibers, usually insoluble, tend to have a structural role um, because they form long fibers because of the long regular arrangements. Here's collagen. Here are the bonds between the collagen molecules. Here's hemoglobin. And here's my takeaway point um, for proteins, is that proteins give us an enormous diversity of potential structures. And those potential structures are heritable. And the diversity of structures is a result of the alleles that you inherit and that you pass on. Therefore, the frequency of those alleles is subject to natural selection. So the whole point with proteins and the whole, you know, one of the synoptic things to think about is that the organism that is carrying the alleles is subject to selection. And that may be as a consequence of the proteins that the organism is carrying, making them more or less successful. So when you have a mutation in a bacteria and that enables it to produce a slightly different protein, that mutation may be enabling it to survive an antibiotic. As a result, it doesn't get killed by the antibiotic, so therefore it's passed on to um, the offspring of that bacterium. Therefore, that allele becomes more frequent in the subsequent population. Okay, next week it's osmosis and water potential. Um, I'll be doing lots of work on calculations of uh, you know, turga pressure and hemolysis and how to plot it and all that sort of thing. Um, not the most interesting, but certainly one of the things that students do struggle with so if anybody wants to come along to that you're more than welcome to um if you want to come along then please register at alablebiologytutor.com um if you found it useful please tell your friends it may well be streamed on youtube and it may be recorded um so if you want to watch any parts then you can do um i've got ocr and edxl read throughs of sample papers on my website um, so if anybody's interested in um, downloading and buying those, you're very welcome to. Um, I'm also just put together a um, oh, electronic version of most of the multiple choice questions for OCR, and I'll be putting that on my website over the next few days. Okay, any questions, people? Anything I can answer for you?